Hello, innovators. I'm Todd Wyant, and welcome to the Bridging the Gap podcast presented by Applied Software. You're invited to join our MEP and construction innovation adventure with a mission to propel this great industry forward. My guest today is Dylan Mitchell. He is the host of the Construction Corner podcast, having designed millions of square feet in Revit from everything for K-12, higher education, healthcare, industrial, and mixed use. Dylan is well-versed in the construction industry. Welcome to the show, Dylan. Hey, Todd. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Uh, well, let's get started with how you got into the construction industry to begin with. Absolutely. Yeah. In growing up, you know, I think a lot of us as kids <laughs> played with Legos, uh, did, you know, couch and cushion forts, all that kind of stuff. So for me, I've always had like a mind towards building things and being a part of, you know, building bigger stuff. So I went to yeah. school for engineering and really why I got into engineering was I lived off the grid and today, you know, we have all these renewables, everything uh, in that realm of solar, wind, hydro, all that kind of stuff is fairly standard today, especially solar. And in high school, I lived off the grid. We generated all of our own power, had a battery bank, completely self-sustained, and that got me into engineering. So I became an electrical engineer since power systems were something I had lived with, right? Most people don't, you just, you plug stuff in and it, it works magically. But yeah. for me, I had the experience of, oh, we have a power system. Oh, you've got to like maintain a generator and batteries and all this stuff to live. So for me, it was very real, very, you know, close to home, if you will, in experiencing you know, renewable energy and what true like sustainability looks like. So went to school for that, became an electrical engineer. And I did a lot of work in power systems. Uh, electrical safety in particular was what I spent the first five years of my career doing. So went into plants, got a ton of hands-on experience and open up switch gear and panels and all sorts of electrical gear that most don't ultimately have. I had kind of learned most everything, I reached a plateau within that field and was looking around. And I just happened to get a job at an architecture and engineering firm and having looked at you know, hundreds and hundreds of power systems, the electrical design piece of it was fairly straightforward to me. There was a lot of new things that I learned and fire alarm and lighting, but that was really how I got my start, if you will, in the AE industry. And because I had all this power system experience, it was pretty easy for me to move up very quickly that I understood a lot of the, the system since I had so much kind of hands-on knowledge of all these moving forward. And then getting my PE, I got my MBA. So I led teams, which, you know, led to more and more work very quickly in my career to where, you know, now I've done millions of square feet across all the, <laughs> the industries that you've named. Yeah, that's really interesting. So uh, what kind of leg up do you think you're, background uh, of really getting the, that hands-on experience in such an early age gave you in this field? It gave me a ton. One thing that I think a lot of people have a, a big misconception on, and it, it comes up a lot. I live in California now, and with California, we've had a lot of power outages. And why do you have power outages? And you know what is solar good for um, in the industry? And a lot of things like that. What I think most people don't realize is you use a lot of power. <laughs> you use, like, if you drink coffee, your coffee pot is one of the biggest power consumers. You know, I love coffee. I drink a lot of it. And it's, you, you rethink how a lot of this stuff gets done on a daily basis, right? If you're a woman out there and you use a straightener or blow dryer for your hair, I don't, but, you know, or if you're a guy and you do, <laughs> right? Like, that, it takes a lot of power. So, Mm -hmm. Ultimately, solar for a home is not a sustainable piece of power. Like we turned on our generator very often, uh, based on a daily basis, to power the house, right? To charge up the batteries. Mm -hmm. Like it is not solar in and of itself is not sustainable. Wind can be, but and ultimately everything's buffered with a battery bank. So these like very practical things that I think get lost because most everyone's connected to the grid, right? And the grid is that big quote battery. Um, that we all use. Right. So a lot of this stuff, it, while good intentions <laughs> are, are there, 
there's a lot of things that get lost kind of in the weeds. Yeah, for sure. Where do you think the industry is really going with that uh, on the sustainability track and, and thinking we're not too far away from the 2030 challenge end date here. Um, and there's still, there's a lot of room left to go. Yeah, for, I mean, the biggest push and it, it has been for a long time is battery technology, right? That's where, that's where everything ends up needing to go. You know, batteries haven't gotten all that much better in a hundred years, right? Your deep cycle lead acid battery from 1902 to power some of the first cars are not much different than we have today. Granted, lithium ion has come a long way, but battery technology and that buffer system is really ultimately what we need. You know, when you think of the grid and like mm -hmm. everything is on demand generation, right? So it's generated at a power station, however many hundreds of miles from your house and shows up, <laughs> uh, you know, when you need it. And the grid does a very good job, which when you think of how like the scale of which power is generated in the world and it's all instant usage is pretty mm -hmm. crazy to think about, right? There's no storage. So that's, that's always been the missing link for renewables is that uh, battery piece and then or some storage piece within there. And then really the right. efficiency levels of, you know, solar and wind. There's a lot of energy in a gallon of gasoline um, and natural gas and coal that really that same energy equivalent is just not in most renewables. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, well, let's uh, dive into some contact. You know, what are some misconceptions that, that you see people have around technology and construction? So if you're not in construction, one of the biggest, I think, misconceptions is that technology is just a bunch of dumb dirt movers or guys pounding hammers, nails, right? Like a, just a dumb industry, which for mm -hmm. those of us in the industry, you know, as you guys know, and you do, there's a lot of technology. There's a lot of really cool things in construction from logistics, right. like getting things to site or all the stuff that's going on in pre-con where you're building out wall sections or heck, modular units for a hotel to be set on site, right? All that technology that goes into something that simple or complex, really, when you think about it. But I think that's probably the biggest misconception for those that are outside the industry about mm. construction and technology and its uses and just how widespread it is. Yeah, for sure. There's definitely a, a marketing problem <laughs> in construction of, of just how advanced and, and how, uh, how much tech and innovation is really going on in the construction industry. Yeah, I think most people think houses, right? They think what they're in every day, especially you know, <laughs> this day and age, we're all we're all at home, we're all in our own houses. You're very familiar with your house now. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh wow, I didn't know that this room existed or um, things like that, right? With, but then you look at commercial construction, and especially like very complex places like hospitals. There's some of the most complex mm -hmm. there are, and. Most people, you know, if you're in an operating room, you're usually unconscious, so you're not seeing anything, right? It's not a place you want to be in a hospital, but they're some of the most right. complex thousand square feet that you're going to encounter. And most people just don't have an experience with that and everything that gets crammed into that thousand square feet. And what is in TV or in the movies is not always <laughs> realistic of what's actually in the operating room. <laughs> So I think there's a lot of things that get misconstrued, you know, from your basic house to what actually happens in like commercial construction and how really cool and complex a lot of these projects really are. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So what about any internal misconceptions in the construction industry? So you mentioned about the external, but any kind of misconceptions of those already in the industry? I think the biggest ones that, you know, we end up running across is, you know, I don't have time for another tool. I don't have time to add this thing into to whatever we're doing. They see technology as a bad thing, which again, I think is, mm -hmm. is a mindset uh, and really a poor marketing piece where it's, we're not having a growth mindset ultimately is what it comes down to is we're not looking right. to, to get better. It's, this is what we've done. This is what works. 
And while that's a, a good thing to have in construction, so you don't ultimately get sued, but is also that you need to continue pushing that innovation bar because we don't, we're running into a people problem, right? We don't have enough skilled people in the industry to accomplish what we do. This is on the design side, the construction side. So we need to continue to add people and technology is really the way to kind of help ramp this up because we have a lack of skilled people we need to find ways to innovate to get ultimately to get the job done right to to get results mm -hmm. not just you know time for dollars type of you know trade-off but technology is usually people think that they don't have the time to do it and it's quite the opposite <laughs> you don't have the time not to learn this to get better and think of it more as an investment than as a something that you like have to do right yeah yeah for sure so you were hitting on this just then a bit dylan but what do you see as the really the promise that technology holds for construction within construction that we're going to ultimately get to a better product right that's really i think where a lot of construction gets to is to remove a lot of the the monotony the tedium the small things that we have to do to get a project out the door is ultimately to, to go to higher level tasks to create a more consistent product again on both the design and the construction side to create a consistent product that's better designed and just remove these kind of low value skills uh, within the industry yeah so I want to circle back because I think it's a big point to something that you brought up earlier with the, the mindset shift that's required to adopt new technology and really embracing that growth mindset. Well, um, what kind of mental shift do you really think is, is required for that? I think one is the awareness that a growth mindset is needed, right? That we can't always just do what's always worked. Mm -hmm. Um, you can, I mean, what you read Carol Dweck's book, <laughs> growth mindset, uh, but in there it's, it's really a willingness to, to change. That's kind of the, the core of it and not change for change sake. I think far too often within the construction industry, within any industry, we adopt something because again, it's going to be the sil silver bullet. It's the thing that somebody gave us that, you know, was, was promised so much but is to, to change, to look at new things, to see how they can help you to grow, to develop, to become better and see what works, see what fits, to have that curiosity. And I think some of that gets lost because somebody got burned somewhere along the way. And in construction, there's a drastic overreaction on the, the same side of things, right? Hey, this didn't work, so it'll never work. And we kind of have to get over that to, okay, why didn't it work? We're, we're talking in very general terms where we need to be very specific. Like, what didn't this work? Did, you know, was Dylan the <laughs> crux of this thing not working? You know, and now Todd's going to come in and, and take over, right? What is the, the crux of that situation? And being very specific to then address the problem. In construction, in most industries, we typically generalize what the problem is where it's really like, it was this one thing on this one project that was the problem that we can now let's address that. And, oh, now it works. Right. So getting past that, it's, so it's really just, again, a marketing thing of, hey, we need to, to grow and adopt. Let's not take drastic measures. Let's get very specific about these problems. Yeah. Well, and to your point too, I, I think it's really important and, and very much overlooked uh, taking the time to debrief after something and really figure out what worked well and then what didn't work and can what what didn't work be fixed next time and are there things that you can tweak to make that process work better you don't have to throw everything out just because a part of the process didn't work right yeah so much through construction it's always we're on to the next project you know we're already behind on the next thing and nobody takes the two hour meeting to pause and say, okay, guys, right. What happened? Right. What, what went right? What went wrong? What can we do better? What needs to improve? 
or to even fix it along the way, right? It's the quick fix band-aid, not let's solve this forever. Like take the extra 30 minutes on this project to fix the thing that's wrong so that it's fixed forever and not just, oh, we got to do this on every project moving forward. So now it's a, you know, 10 year problem, not a, <laughs> not a 30 minute problem. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so I I'm curious, you know, we've all seen people that are, you know, way, uh, you know, progressive on, on the change scale and love change, want to total overhaul everything. And then we, you have the other side of the spectrum where people run away from change at, at all costs. But do you think that there, you can teach somebody to have a growth mindset and kind of pull them in that direction? Or is it what you are is what you are? And that's it. That's a great question. It really is. Because through the change piece, and everybody can change, you just have to understand at the kind of basic level why change is hard. So you've ingrained for years, and this is why it's harder for an older person, right? Somebody that's been in the industry or done something a certain way for a long period of time, is you have ingrained neural pathways of this, this is how mm -hmm. you do it, right? You do it automatically. If it's your drive to work, if it's getting coffee in the morning, right? You have an ingrained neural pathway of this is how you do it. You've done it every day for the last however many years. And then to change that pattern, right? It's just like a smoker, a quitting coffee, like a lot of these things. It's physically painful to change because you have to change the neural pathways. So you're physically mm -hmm. rewiring your brain. In that, you have to get wins. So you have to find ways to get a small win throughout that change process, right? So if you're, you're trying to give up coffee or smoking or whatever it is, you've got to find an instruction, right, for changing technologies, right, to reward people like, hey, you learned something, right? You learned how to do this, great job. Because then it gives a dopamine reward for people to want to continue to do it. So you can you mm -hmm. can change, you can have that growth mindset, but you have to have the corresponding reward to it, right? Mm -hmm. Fifty dollars, it could be just hey, great job, recognition. There's a lot of ways to give people that reward. So if you're like Revit is probably the biggest uh, conversion, right? To go from AutoCAD to Revit in construction, and a lot of people just they have trouble with it. But you have to be patient with everyone that's learning that transition, right? Hey, don't be afraid to ask me questions. What did you learn today? Hey, that's awesome, right? It's awesome that you learned that. Hey, doesn't this feel good to be able to do your own work, right? Not have to hand it off. Doesn't it feel good to have the ability to print your own projects or to update your own stuff? And by doing those reward systems in it, you allow people to feel good about the change process that they're going under so that they can now move forward. Because it, it is quite literally painful for somebody that's done something for such a long period of time to change because you are rewiring all those neural pathways, but coming out of it, you you can do it. And then you ingrain the new habit. Uh, and then it's, you know, you, you never want to go back, right? Like I never want to go back to AutoCAD from, from Revit and whatever's next, you know, we'll, we'll adopt to that next thing too. Yeah, yeah, I think that's great. Uh kind of the, that gamification, but the positive reinforcements is that's a, an awesome way to, to go about it and give people the motivation to want to embrace the, whatever the new thing is. You have to. Yeah. Nice. Uh, well, how do you, um, debunk the, the retort and the, that mindset that we've all heard that technology is coming for your job and it's just going to replace people. So let's take the design side of construction because that's where I come from is you have, you have two modes in basically any design firm. You have top, right? <laughs> where you're so overwhelmed with work that you don't know how anything is going to get done or you have no projects. There's really very little in between. And that's the same with most construction firms. You're either inundated and mm -hmm. you have too many jobs to bid, too many things to go do or you're like looking for the next thing. And there's really almost no in between. So in that, 
the only way that you're going to get through projects is to use technology, right? The only way that you're going to not kill yourself is to use something to get the job done. And in mm-hmm. on the design side, especially, we're, and I don't know why it is, but we, we think in for jobs in terms of hours, right? What is our budgeted hours for this project? But in all reality, for most every design firm and most every project, it's a fixed fee, right? <laughs> Lump sum fees. And most everybody in that firm is salary. So you all like your, your revenue and your cost are fixed. So time is now no longer like a thing other than get this done by this deadline. So if you become mm-hmm. more results oriented, then you're going to work on getting those projects done. So technology isn't ultimately killing for your job. Technology is getting rid of all the, the minor things so that you can focus on the, the big picture, on the value, on getting the project done. And this is, again, it's a mindset shift from going from time and hours on the design side, especially to results, right? You're, the company is getting paid to give them a project right, and designed building and they don't care how long you worked on it or how little is it done, right? Is it something that we can go to bid that it's gonna give us what we want under budget? You know, that's ultimately what they're looking for. So again, the only way that you're gonna get through those projects in a timely manner without killing yourself, without, and as we've all experienced, these influx of projects and that high of, I don't know how I'm gonna get this done can go on for a long time and go on for years to where you're just in this endless cycle of project to project, week to week, not, you know, trying to hit the next deadline, the next deadline, the next deadline. The only way to get out of that is either you lose all your projects on your work, right? The economy dries up, no one builds anything, or you have to use something else to do it, right? Because we, mm-hmm. it's, we can't find the people, right? Because that, that was the way that we solved this in the past. You go and hire more people, you bring them in, you mm-hmm. train them, but that takes time, effort, energy to, to do that. But now we, we can't even find the, enough people to, to do the projects. So the only way out of this is technology. The only way to not work 80 hour weeks. And again, you're, you're salaried. You're not getting paid anymore to do that. So the only way to get through it, the only way to you know, live a, a meaningful life, not stress, not worried about getting the next thing out is through technology. And this goes for I mean, both. On, no, not everyone can work overtime you know, for 100 hour weeks or 80 hour weeks for five years on end with no ramifications. Right. Oh yeah, sure. That will take a toll. <laughs> uh, well, what's like the the low hanging fruit in shifting to that new mindset of being results oriented? What's kind of the the first action item that you encourage people to to take in that? I mean, first you've got to wrap your your mind around results, right? You've got to you know, shift towards this is what we want. We want a project that gets out the mm-hmm. door, right? And not. And it helps a little bit being at home where you can't see if people are still in the office, right? I think that was the first big domino to fall because I think most people mm-hmm. judge, especially in the design community, like, how are you still here, <laughs> right? Are you still in the office? <laughs> are you still working, you know? Are, and whether you were working or not, sure. it didn't matter. It was a perception that you were. It's um, a physical presence. Yeah, it, it truly was. Um, and I think now with where you can't see, things are still getting done, that that was the first big domino to fall was the perception of always having to be here, always having to be on. Uh-huh. So now that that domino has, has fallen, where you're seeing just results because you're not seeing people in the office or didn't, you know, I know a lot of us are starting to go back to work, but we're back to the office. So you saw that fall. So now you can look at results. And I think more and mm-hmm. more executives are starting to see that as not a time card, <laughs> hours on a project, but actual actual results and projects going out the door. Um, there's a lot of things to work on. And I mean, there's plenty of automation tools out there to, to help, um, you know, whether it's from project setup to the stuff that we do. I mean, there's there's a lot of dominoes that, that can fall, but I think, I mean, the big first one was just not worried about how many hours people were in the office. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really good. Uh, 
you're really focused in on the electrical market currently. So one of those automation pieces, want to dive into that. How, how does Revit automation really enhance the, the workflow for that market? Yeah, so across Revit, I mean, this is the beauty of BIM, right? We have all this data, all of this information within a single model, right? It becomes a single source of truth. So now with automation, you can start to place content intelligently across rooms, right? You know what that room name is, where in AutoCAD, you had no idea. It was just a bunch of dumb lines and you were reading it and hope somebody didn't misspell something along the way or <laughs> miss place a tag or anything like that. So with Revit, you have all this intelligence. So what we end up doing is utilizing that intelligence to place devices, you know, from lights to outlets to switches, occupancy sensors, fire alarm devices, low voltage, you know, data security across the model. So we know where that content goes historically and using your own Revit families, your own content so that all your schedules still work. So that your symbols still show up the way that you want, right? Because every firm has their own unique symbols. Uh, why we haven't standardized, I don't know, but <laughs> every firm has got their own way of showing stuff and that's fine. So for what our software does for California Studios is to automate the placement of all that content. So you effectively go from a blank model to design documents in just a few minutes is really what we, we promise we deliver on is to go from zero to design documents with all your content, all your lights, switches, outlets, panels, fire alarm devices, low voltage, everything into the model. So now what that does is not only take out all that drafting time, that kind of low skill labor, if you will, to put all that content in the model, which all of it can be moved, right? It's just like somebody placed it. But now what you can have is the higher value conversation, right? You can have the conversations of what do you need? What are you looking for? Here's a because this is the typical or traditional path was let's either put nothing in the model and have a conversation with somebody about it, which you can still do, or we're going to throw some stuff against the wall. We're going to spend all this time to do it. You know, it could be a week, could be a month, whatever for this next meeting to then have a conversation with the owner or the interior designer or the architect about it to then change all of it. So you just scrap that week or month of work to just do it all over again. So what we do is take, you can do that, right? <laughs> you go from zero to design documents, all that content, have the conversation, delete it all out of the model, put it all back and that process to give 10 minutes. Nice, very cool. Uh, what are some of the, the resources that you, uh, that have helped you really kind of stay ahead of all the, the technology trends and automation stuff that is out there? So in, a lot of this is in what we do at Cowboy Studios and why we can stay kind of ahead of it is we come from the industry, right? I come from the industry. I'm a licensed engineer. I've stamped millions of square feet, done a lot of projects. And I, I really know and understand what engineers go through from project to project. I understand how to create Revit templates and all the stuff that goes into to Revit where having people that come from outside of construction, outside of this industry that don't know what a change order is, they're not going to be able to evolve at the same rate, you know, that we are. And so mm -hmm. really just our connection to the industry is what allows us to stay ahead of trends, if you will. And construction is also an industry that it does take a while to evolve, right? Timelines are in three year <laughs> increments, right? You design a project, it takes you a year, six months, and then, you know, it takes two years to build, right? So you're in three year project cycles. Granted for design teams, mm -hmm. it's, you know, a six month to a year project cycle for anything. So a lot of people coming in from outside of construction, you know, you're used to like software updates, which again, we're a software company, but people that are used to software timelines is like a week or a day, right? not <laughs> six months, a year. It is a very, very different timeline, a very different industry. Right. People move at a very different pace because again, like when you think of software, it's, while it can be expensive, it's not in the millions of dollars range, right? With construction, you know, uh, if you're in a design firm, like 
projects for like a $20 million project was small, right? Like that when you, when you start to design big projects, 10, 20 million is, is like, okay, this is a 50,000 square foot building, right? It's not, it's yeah. not that big, you know, and then right. you start working on 50, 75 million, you know, hundred million dollar projects, billion dollar projects right now you're talking about scale and size. And that's what construction has that basically no other industry does is working at scale on very large projects with a lot of dollars in it. Um, so I, that's really how we can say ahead of everybody is we're in the industry. We know what people want. We understand the timelines and the timeframes um, and we're in it for the long haul. We're not, you know, that's why I host a podcast to talk about construction, just like you, you know, we're in it to help the industry, not, not to necessarily make a quick buck and leave, go away. Cause we didn't understand it. Right. We're here for the, the long haul. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, so why did you decide to start your podcast? Uh, it coincided with me starting my own company. Um, there's a lot of, I think, talk in the industry that goes on behind closed doors, kind of a lot of stuff that we're talking about here that everybody talks about, but nobody does openly um, for fear of getting fired or what the company is going to say or anything like that. They don't have the kind of backing or uh, acknowledgement of the company to go out and say these things. So for me, yeah. it was one for my own selfish uh, needs of and wants of wanting to talk about all this stuff, do it openly. And then on the other side, I wasn't afraid of ever getting fired, right? It's I'm my own boss, I own my own company. Um, and there's just a lot of things that I felt could benefit the, the construction industry that just weren't talked about as openly as should be. Um, and especially for those people that didn't ever go to a conference, didn't, you know, go and talk to other firms. It was frowned upon to <laughs> talk to a quote unquote enemy for when in yeah. reality that there's enough work for everybody to go around. It's, um, it's a really a bad mindset and we're trying to break down those barriers, those walls. I mean, I co-host with a general contractor, right? I'm from the design side, contractor side. So in having these conversations, again, it's not one side or the other. It's, we're all in this together how can we move forward together as an industry, as construction to bring more people, you know, into construction, into engineering, into architecture, into the trades and knowing that there's a really a spot, a space for you throughout the industry, no matter what you want to do. Yeah. I love it. I think it takes all of our voices collectively preaching that message and, um, you know, giving out the, the true story of construction of all the, the tech and the, the innovation that we started the conversation with that it, it's here it's in the industry this is a, a great time to be in construction yeah and just to know like you can you can be a technology manager <laughs> you can they all need it support right you're you're a marketing manager right we need to sell and craft stories about what we do and the projects that we create for the communities that we live in you know like everyone has a part and you can make a great career in a lot of different ways through this. I mean, it's the biggest industry in the world. Why wouldn't you want to be a part of it? Yeah. Preach. I, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, how do people get a hold of you and find out more information? Yeah. Dylan Mitchell on LinkedIn, uh, Calabunga Studios. You can find all of our stuff there. Uh, K-O-W-A-B-U-N-G-A, -A, just like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. For all those uh, fans out there, kids of the 90s. Nice. Um, I love it. <laughs> yeah. So Calabunga Studios, find us all there. And then uh, Construction Corner Podcast. We do lives every week on LinkedIn, YouTube, uh, Facebook for, for the podcast. So, you know, if you want to join the conversation, ask a question, we'd be more than happy to have you. And again, uh, you know, love all the stuff you're doing here, Todd, with Bridging the Gap. It's, we just, we need more people and for everybody out there to, to speak up about construction, right? You don't have to go to college. You, you know, and I'm saying that from a guy that, that has a master's, right? To, you don't have to go, if you're, you're great in the trades. If you're great with your hands, if you're great in logistics, you know, there's a, there's a spot for you within construction and to, to understand that and to just maybe talk to firms, you know, they're more than willing to bring in, you know, high school students, kids to understand like, Hey, this is what we do on a daily basis. Is this something you want to get into and just experience it, you know, have a day. Firms are more, more than happy to bring in, you know, the youth and <laughs> experience, expose them 
to the industry. We yeah. just, we need more people that are passionate about construction, about the built environment, about everything that we live and work and play in. Yeah, more than agree with that. I, I think, it, like I, I said, I think the, the more champions of that message, the, the better that are out there. Absolutely. Well, uh, last question for you. What does innovation mean to you? Innovation means really having that growth mindset, the, that you're teachable, that you're willing to learn. I think so many people, when they, they hear innovation, they, they run away. They're, they're not happy with uh, something that went on in the past. And innovation is really is moving the needle forward, even if it's 1% a day, that compounding effort over a long period of time is going to benefit you tremendously, right? It's 365x <laughs> is what it amounts to in a year, right? If, if you compound actually 1%, you know, every day. So understanding yeah. that innovation is a is a small process compounded over a long period of time, just like how we build buildings, right? It's one brick at a time, one layer of sheetrock at a time across a project. It's incremental innovation consistently applied. And just to have that that growth mindset, that ability to, to learn, to be teachable, to take information and run with it, apply it. If you don't use it, you're not going to grow. Um, so really innovation is, is just that compounded over a long period of time. And who better than do it than construction and <laughs> understanding long time frames? Yeah. I, I love the simplicity of that, of just taking it one day at a time. You know, innovation can be so, it can seem so lofty and kind of unattainable of just this big pie in the sky idea, but it, it doesn't have to be just find all of that one little thing to, to improve on each day. That's it, man. Tomorrow is not promised. Yesterday is gone. You only have today. So, you know, there's pick a few things to do each and every day to move you forward, you know, read, drink plenty of water, right? <laughs> you come in hungover, that day's kind of, kind of gone. Um, so understand that like, what you do today is also going to affect tomorrow, but you're only promised, you're not even promised the rest of today, right? It's, and you're not promised tomorrow. So you only have today to do the things. And, you know, the longer that you wait, procrastinate, whatever, again, you're, you're not promised it. So understand that you have today and to do the things you can today, and that'll move you forward today for tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Dylan, thanks so much for taking the time to join the show. I really appreciate the, the conversation. Yeah. Likewise, Todd, we'll, we'll have to have you on as well and uh, continue this uh, wonderful conversation on how we can all move the industry forward.